This is CBN News Watch. And thank you so much for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. I want to begin this half hour in the Middle East. Israel has reportedly struck targets in Iran in response to last weekend's massive missile and drone attack against the Jewish state. Chris Mitchell now reports from Jerusalem. Some see the attack was designed to respond to Iran's attack, but not spark a wider regional war. The Iranian Tasneem news agency reported the assault took place in the southeastern part of the city near its nuclear energy mountain. Isfahan is the site of one of Iran's major nuclear sites, enriching uranium for Iran's nuclear program. According to the Jerusalem Post, the attack in Isfahan was carried out with long-range missiles launched from aircraft, not drones or land-to-air missiles. An Iranian official told Reuters, there is no plan for an immediate response. It is not clear who is behind the attack. An Iranian TV anchor downplayed the attack and quoted a military official in Isfahan. Uh, he did uh, confirm that uh, there were some uh, loud sounds that were heard in the east of the city of Esfahan, and this was related to the air defense system, as uh, we told you and our viewers before, uh, triggered by the presence of uh, three small drones uh, that were present in that area. On local television, other reporters near the area showed how quiet and normal Isfahan looks. Middle East expert Avi Melaman told CBN News Iran seems to be minimizing the story on purpose. Here in Israel, Israelis woke up Friday morning to the news of the strike. After the massive Iranian attack days ago, they anticipated the attack, although so far Israel is not taking responsibility. Unnamed U.S. officials apparently confirmed to U.S. media that Israel carried out the strikes, but Israeli officials say they don't understand while the U.S. confirmed the attack, the attack in Isfahan took place on the 85th birthday of Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. Meanwhile, some analysts are saying that Israel's response was measured, only enough to give an answer to the Iranian attack. That's because it's preparing to enter the last Hamas stronghold in the city of Rafah in Gaza to complete the goal of finishing off Hamas and its leadership and getting the hostages back. IDF troops are still operating in the central Gaza Strip, eliminating terrorists and striking military compounds, observation posts and rocket launchers and launching points. They've also destroyed 17 tunnel shafts. But for now, the world's focus is on the tensions between Israel and Iran and what comes next. I want to continue now with our Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell joining us from Jerusalem. So, Chris, what could come next with the tensions with Israel and Iran? Well, I think one of the keys in that report we just uh, listened to, uh, Ephraim, is that one Iranian official told Reuters there's no plan for an immediate response since he said it's not clear who's behind the attack. So possibly we could be having a, a period of quiet or maybe this uh, this round between Israel and Iran, uh, Israel and Iran might be over. Uh, it might be the case that at least right now, Israel and Iran might not want want a wider war. And uh, so the regime seems to be playing down, downplaying the incident. And uh, who knows, at least could we close the book on this face-off, uh, at least temporarily. Are there more specific reasons for Israel and Iran to close this matter? Yeah, first of all, all the people here are looking for signs. They're looking, they're seeing what Israel and Iran are saying and doing or not saying or not doing. As we said, Iran's not make, making a big deal about this right now. And Israel also is not making a big deal about it. They really haven't had an official announcement. We haven't seen Prime Minister Netanyahu or the IDF chief spokesman. Uh, for Iran, it might be a matter of timing. I mean, their goal hasn't changed of destroying Israel. Uh, but they may not want a full-scale war right now. They want to be pursuing their nuclear program. They might be recalibrating their plans after last week's attack and this, this in today's response. Uh, for Israel, it seems that Rafa is the more immediate short-term goal. They want to make sure that they do eliminate Hamas, uh, you know, for weeks and maybe a couple of months now. The goal has been to go into Rafa, and, uh, and yet that's been uh, delayed and delayed. Uh, after Rafa and maybe the final uh, battalions there of Hamas, its last major stronghold, Hezbollah, and then maybe Iran and its nuclear sites. 
Uh, so, and one, one other note, Ephraim, the attack is significant in the sense that it was near Isfahan, one of the main nuclear sites. The message maybe to Iran is we can hit them if we want to. Do you think this will blow out the spark of the possibility of an expansion of a wider war in the Middle East, at least for now? Well, I think we're, we're heading that way, Ephraim. Uh, there, it seems like inevitable that there's going to be a mid, wider uh, Middle East war, but maybe not right now. Uh, we don't know, but we do see, if you're looking at the signs here, that a wider war is on the horizon. Uh, Israel has to deal with Hamas down in Rafa, but it also has to deal with Hezbollah. That's the, really the main proxy army of uh, Iran. Uh, some anticipate that could be just weeks away. Now, if that happens, how is Iran going to respond? Uh, if Hamas is eliminated and Hezbollah, that's two of the main, really, proxy groups of Iran. And how are they going to respond to that? Uh, also left unanswered, but maybe uh, a little sign today, will Israel hit Iran's nuclear sites to keep them uh, from getting a nuclear weapon? They seem to be right on the cusp of getting military-grade uranium uh, right now. Chris, do Middle East nations think Iran went too far, sending more than 300 drones and missile against Israel? Uh, and is Iran now more isolated than before? Well, I think it is to a certain, uh, certain point. Uh, there was a choosing of sides uh, last weekend during the attack. Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, they all stood with Israel. They all seemed to participate in stopping those 350 drones uh, and missiles. So, and dozens of nations have condemned Iran for that attack. It could be another reason for the measured Israeli response uh, by, by Israel to sort of keep this international coalition together. What is the latest with the hostage negotiations, and could the latest tensions with Israel and Iran affect that? Well, unfortunately, it's kind of a grim outlook for the hostage negotiations. Uh, Hamas is taking a pretty extreme stand on this. Uh, they are asking Israel to end the war pull out of Gaza for only 20 of the hostages. Uh, we don't even know how many are still alive. Uh, ironically, though, this, this face-off that may be ending uh, temporarily between Israel and Iran may help the hostages. If Israel is allowed to go into Rafah, it, maybe they could be rescued. Maybe the Hamas leaders could be, could be uh, eliminated or captured. Uh, so why that's so important right now to be praying for their release and their conditions right now, Ephraim. Indeed, indeed. Before we let you go, what can we expect this evening on Jerusalem Dateline? Well, we'll have an update on the situation. We also have analysis with Jonathan Conricus. He's the uh, former IDF international spokesman. Uh, he's also a senior fellow now with the Foundation of the Defense of Democracies, and uh, he'll be with us. Uh, we have analysis with uh, Middle East, uh, our own Middle East uh, expert, John Waggy. We're going to have a story on Near O's, which is a uh, one of the kibbutzes that was was devastated on October 7th, and they held a Seder to remember the people that won't be there on Passover. We also have an important story on sanctions, why uh, the uh, Biden administration has really released billions of dollars to Iran. And finally, Rabbi Adlerstein is going to talk about last week's uh, miracle of how 350 uh, projectiles really didn't do much damage to Israel. A miracle indeed. Thank you so much. Chris Mitchell reporting from Jerusalem. As always, we appreciate your insight. Stay safe and know that we back here are praying for you and our entire team there uh, in Israel. I want to remind you that you can see the latest on um, Jerusalem Dateline this evening on the CBN News Channel. It begins at 8 Eastern. You can also watch it on the CBN News app or you can watch it on YouTube. Coming up, kidnapped and murdered. This Lebanese man is believed to have been assassinated. See how he and other Christians have been caught in the crossfire between Hezbollah and Israel. Stay with us. You're watching CBN News Watch. Introducing a brand new way to start your morning, the CBN News Quick Start Podcast. Each weekday morning at 7 a.m., get quick highlights of the day's important news, then an in-depth analysis that goes beyond the headlines, insights that matter to people of faith. Discover how God is moving around the world and here at home. Find the CBN News Quick Start Podcast on iTunes or wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts, because truth matters. 
Welcome back to CBN News Watch. A well-known Christian politician in Lebanon who publicly opposed Hezbollah was recently found murdered. Now, the Christian community in that country is more worried than ever about their safety. George Thomas brings us the story. A Syrian gang is believed to have kidnapped and murdered Pascal Sleiman, a strong believer and senior member of the Christian Lebanese Forces Party. The uh, army intelligence are currently working with the Red Cross to recover his body from Syria. Experts here see it as a political assassination linked to Hezbollah, <laughs> meant to frighten the Christian community and whoever else opposes the group's fight against Israel. Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah took to the airwaves shortly after the government announced Sleiman's murder, accusing Christians of stirring up chaos. They are not people of truth, nor people of justice, and they do not care about the national interest, civil peace or anything. They are people of strife and seek civil war. Christians feel caught between the Jewish state and the Islamic terror group. The two enemies last fought in 2006. Here, along the Valley of Playa, a Christian community in South Lebanon, the folks I have spoken to cannot believe that Israel and Hezbollah are once again at war. In fact, this is a region that has seen war for more than 50 years. We're struggling in all aspects, no matter who the players are or their agendas. Regardless of which country they're affiliated with, at the end of the day, the number one loser in all this are the Christians of Lebanon. Hezbollah, meaning the party of God, wields significant power in Lebanese society. They control parts of Beirut, southern Lebanon, and the eastern Bekaa Valley region. The basic goal of Hezbollah is to distribute the Islamic revolution and to take over Lebanon and establish an Islamic state in Lebanon. Uh, war against Israel serves this goal. When you look at this map and you look at Hezbollah today, what keeps you up at night? <clears throat> Everything. Former IDF intelligence officer Sarit Zahavi is a leading expert on Hezbollah. She says even though Lebanon has the Middle East's largest proportion of Christians at roughly 30%, Muslims dominate the landscape, with the Shia wielding the greatest influence. Hezbollah is Shia, and their power runs deep throughout Lebanon's political structure, including the military. Half of the combat soldiers in the Lebanese army are Muslim Shiites. They are not going to clash with their brothers in Hezbollah. You can have a family that one is serving in the Lebanese army and the other one is serving with Hezbollah. It's why many Christians like Joseph feel vulnerable to their attacks, intimidation and persecution. We are concealing his identity for his safety. A few weeks back, Joseph discovered Hezbollah firing rockets across the border from his farm. They keep using our land as a launching pad. They assemble their missiles here, then fire them into Israel. In this exclusive interview with CBN News, Joseph told us that he repeatedly asked the Lebanese army to intervene with no success. We don't want our land to be a staging ground for war between these two parties. We take no part in this. What's happening in Gaza is not our war. Oklahoma Senator James Langford sits on the Senate Select Intelligence Committee. During a recent visit to Israel, he told CBN News the Lebanese government and army have failed to stop Hezbollah from weaponizing the South. They have over 100,000 missiles that are pointed at Israel right now uh, towards peaceful areas, towards uh, civilian areas. Uh, so Israelis live under the constant threat that at any point Iran could say go and Hezbollah will begin firing missiles in from an area where there's not supposed to be any weapon systems at all. UN Security Council Resolution 1701, which ended Hezbollah and Israel's last conflict in 2006, mandates that the Lebanese army, with the help of UN peacekeeping forces, is supposed to disarm the terror group, move its fighters north of the Litani River, and conduct joint patrols of the region. None of that has happened. The United States needs to continue to put pressure on the Lebanese government 
to be able to push them to say what happens from Hezbollah is happening in Lebanon. You are responsible for what's happening in your own country and allowing a separate military to be able to threaten Israel and at the whole time to say, well, that's not our military, that's a different military, doesn't work. This incident sparked outrage among protesters who have begun destroying cars in the area. Slayman's killing has sparked a flare-up of Christian Muslim tensions here, leading to talks of possible civil war. Lebanese authorities have arrested seven in connection with his murder. The Lebanese army's main mission is to prevent a civil war. And Hezbollah made it very, very clear that anybody will try to a little bit damage its power in Lebanon, it may deteriorate into a civil war. George Thomas, CBN News, reporting from Jerusalem and South Lebanon. Still ahead as Passover, Passover draws near, remembering the hostages at kibbutz near Oz. Stay with us. You're watching CBN Newswatch. Ahead of the Passover holiday, family members of hostages from a kibbutz devastated on October 7th gathered in the community dining room to carry out once again for freedom for those in captivity by Hamas. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl was there. The Jewish people celebrate Passover each year with a Seder meal, recalling the Israelites' miraculous exodus from Egypt after Moses told Pharaoh, let my people go. Known as the holiday of freedom, those here have the same message for the captors still holding their loved ones hostage. We want them to celebrate the upcoming holiday with us and not in dark tunnel in inhuman conditions. Let our people go. This is the dining room at Kibbutz near Oz. Last Passover, it was full of hundreds of people celebrating the holiday of freedom for the Passover Seder. This year, there won't be one. A year ago, they all uh, celebrated uh, here in the dining room together. Old people, young people, babies, children. Uh, it's a very special holiday here. Amir al Fasa is the nephew of Avner and Maya Gorin, both murdered by Hamas. Maya's body is still held in Gaza. I want the world to not be indifferent to what happened here to scream and shout with us and, uh, and put uh, pressure on Hamas, uh, Qatar, whatever they can to bring our people back. A Seder table with matzah, grape juice and empty place settings has yellow chairs around it with pictures of those still missing from the kibbutz. While some are confirmed to be dead, the conditions of others, like the family of Ofri Bibas, are unknown. Her brother Yarden, his wife Shiri, and their sons, Ariel and Kfir, who turned one in January, remain captive. Just knowing that no matter how hard it is for me, uh, it, must, it's, it, it is much harder for them. Uh, they are going through hell, and they need us to speak for them and to remind them and to remind the world and uh, that they are over there. And, that it's the most unhumanitarian situation there is. She sees the connection with the upcoming holiday as crucial. Passover is the, we call it the holiday of freedom, and their freedom was being taken from them six months ago. More than a quarter of kibbutz near Oz's members were either killed or kidnapped on October 7th. 36 of them, some of them not alive, are still in Hamas captivity in Gaza. Yael Adar is the mother of 38-year-old Tamir Adar, murdered and held in Gaza. As part of the kibbutz security team, Tamir left his family in the bomb shelter to help defend his community that fateful day. I want every place in the world, just before they say who is guilty, who is not guilty, ask yourselves if it's possible to have a reality where they kidnap people, rape, murder, and the other side is supposed to be quiet? Given the terror attacks that happened in Israel could happen anywhere, Adar questions why the world holds Israel to a double standard. If that reality sounds logical to someone, they can volunteer to have it happen to them. And everyone who says to himself, this won't happen in my country, then they should make sure it doesn't happen in this country. It's impossible that it happens here, and they tell us, stop the war. 
Imagining how her little nephews would enjoy Passover if they were free, Bibis calls on the world to help. Will they be granted the freedom so cruelly taken from them? Hasn't the time come for the whole world to also shout for Ariel and Kfir? A shout for justice, for justice, for humanity, for an end to this nightmare. Let my family go. Let our people go. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Kibbutz near O's. Stay with us. Your Friday Fateful is coming up next. Download the CBN News app, 24-7 News, from a Christian perspective at home or on the road. One place for all of your news. Breaking news alerts. Set daily prayer goals and pray for news stories. Read the most important news and watch CBN News Channel Live. CBN News, because truth matters. Go to CBNNewsApp.com to get the app today. Welcome back. Time now for your Friday Faithful. Today, I want to leave you with this thought. There is no one like the Lord. He is higher than any mountain, deeper than any ocean, and his loving arm reaches you and me. With that word, I encourage you to make today a fabulous Friday. And be sure to have yourself a wonderful, rest-filled weekend. I encourage you to do that on purpose and with purpose. You certainly won't regret it. Well, that will do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. Thank you so much for watching. I want to remind you, you can always find more of our news programs. You can find them on the CBN News channel at any time, as well as online. Now, that address is CBNNews.com. Take a moment, let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today or any day. You can email us. The address to do that is newswatch at cbn.com. And of course, you can always reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We certainly would love to hear from you. Thank you for watching. We'll see you right back here same time come Monday. Goodbye and God bless.